The views, information, or opinions expressed during the filming of this show are solely those of the individuals involved and do not necessarily represent those of Hillsong Channel or Hillsong Church. Why do we see ourselves the way we do? Culture often dictates that our worth, path, and identity are determined by our race, our gender, the things we've done, and the things that have been done to us. Projections of the lives of others and the state of our world saturate our news feeds, making it difficult to distinguish the real from the highlight reel. I'm Natalie Manuel Lee, and in this series, I'll be digging beneath the surface to uncover what it really means to be bold, transparent, and confront our shame. In this season, I'll be speaking with people at the top of their industry, from the realms of music, radio, politics, television, and philosophy, to find out how they navigate shame and translate their hardships into opportunities to refine themselves instead of define themselves. So, how do we rise above challenges to truly operate in our purpose and identity? However our identity and purpose develop, the ability to simply persevere in our calling is something that will always serve us well. I'm exploring the quality of resilience, where it comes from, and what it looks like to live it out. What attitudes and behaviors make speaking our truth constructive as opposed to divisive? How do we distinguish between being motivated by the conviction to live an honorable life and being plagued by shame that picks at our imperfections. And in the midst of being shamed or experiencing hardship, what are the steps to rising up and continuing on our journey? In this episode, I spend time with media personality, author, podcaster, and social commentator, Van Lathan. Until his controversial firing, Van was a long-standing team member in the TMZ newsroom, breaking some of the biggest stories in pop culture and representing an important cultural voice. His public profile shot to greater notoriety in 2018 when he confronted Kanye West over comments made about slavery. Van's resilience is something I've respected for some time, and I was intrigued to hear more about how it developed. Man, Van, I feel like he can unpack the whole series for us. Like, we're talking to him about shame and not feeling good enough about going to church to he was body shamed. A lot of times we think that females are just the only ones that are body shamed and bullied because of their weight. He could talk about where we are as a culture, as a nation, as a generation, and what's happening right now. Can you want to sit? You're about to get your makeup done, too. Oh, for real? That's cool. What was life like growing up for you as a kid in Louisiana? I didn't realize how hard my parents had it because they made it look so easy. Like my father once told me, I asked him why he was so strict, so hard on me. Mm -hmm. And he was like, well, I have to be worse than the streets. You have to fear me more than you do the street. It's growing up with like a, with a kid and he's got a big smile and he's got all of this potential. You hear randomly one day, yo, just to let you know, your homeboy Delvin got killed at the Texaco. Mm. Tefra got killed here. Jason got killed here. Drew got killed here. And he was incredibly afraid of someone alerting him to the fact that that had happened to me. Mm. And I think about now, not about what that was like for me, I think about what that was like for them. Mm. So when I got to my 20s and I finally started trying to work through my brain, there was just a lot there to try to get through. So when you moved to LA, do you feel like you were running from something or were you running to something? It was a, a legit escape. The hurricane had just happened. I had watched South Louisiana, the civilization there, be decimated down to where people were wondering like where are they gonna get food from. It's just a weird situation to be in. Like if you're hungry, you go somewhere and you buy something to cook. But then what happens when there's no food in Walmart? And I saw the amount of apathy that it seemed like the rest of the country had, and just how quickly things could break down. And it pushed me to go out and seek a bigger world. But at the same time, it crystallized for me that I need to get away from where I was, mm -hmm. that there was something that I had to go find. So literally I told people, 
um, on a Monday that I was leaving on a Thursday and I left and never went back home. Distance and fresh scenery can sometimes give us a perspective we needed to make a change. But other times, it's not that simple. And making a change means hard work. I know this is a lesson that Van has learned firsthand, and I was intrigued to hear his insight. You underwent a big weight loss. Mm. Tell me about that. I was at my heaviest around 366. I just round up to 370, it sounds more impressive. I was already on blood pressure medication. It was gonna shorten my life and shorten my effectiveness. I used to like shower with the lights off in the dark. Because you didn't want to see yourself. I didn't want to see myself. How do we stop fat shaming? Because people do it all the time. It's like they almost find joy in it. It's disgusting. I, I, listen, hearing that you're fat or that you've gained weight, when that's something that you deal with, it's debilitating. You fat shame yourself every day, 100 times a day. All the outside world does is reinforce the pain that you're inflicting on yourself. And people say they do it for the right reasons. They say they do it to help people get healthy. All you're doing is hurting people. If you want to help somebody get healthy, be compassionate about it. Compassion will solve everything. If you want to tell someone and address something with someone, be a human being about it. Did you get that sense of this isn't really who I should be from the outside critics or from yourself? I was somebody who wanted to be more active. I was somebody who wanted to dress different, to look different, and it was holding me back. Uh, I wasn't healthy. So I had to make the decision in my life to go through a hard transformation to lose weight. So it was your preference. It wasn't, I guess, ignited from an outside voice. Never works if it is. I had a basketball coach that used to have a, a great saying. There's no such thing as a 15 point shot. If you're down 15, you're not gonna get it back right away. So for me, I had to walk to the scale every day knowing that it wasn't gonna show me my goal weight and I had to do that for a year. Mm -hmm. The only way that you do that is if your mind is different. Sometimes progress has to be the reward. And it's very hard to see that um, when you're first starting out. Yeah. Hi everyone, Natalie Manuel Lee here. You can get this Now With Natalie statement hoodie that I personally designed. Limited quantity available. Get yours now at hillsongchannel.com. Working at TMZ, how did you find your individual voice, knowing that you're working with all these people that just have their own opinions? I never really had a, a problem finding that. The one thing that I learned from my father is that if I haven't really thought something through, if I don't know what I'm talking about, then it's time to learn. Mm -hmm. So if you see me giving my opinion, I'm normally pretty well versed in what it is uh, that I'm talking about. Now let's be honest, TMZ is known to shame people. Okay. Okay. So mm -hmm. how, have you ever had a conflict with your convictions? Mm. When I first got there, I didn't realize the importance of the weight that my particular voice on the show had. As time went on, start to realize that the things that you may say on a platform that large have a real world effect on people's lives. They hear it and then they talk about it. And that's just because over the, the, the course of that, I ran into some people that maybe I had some kind of uh, adverse or cross opinions about. Mm -hmm. um, and that actually f helped form my worldview of how you offer cultural criticism. There's a way that you offer it that is uh, constructive and even helpful. And then there's a way that you offer it that says, hey, look at me. And if you care at all about the culture that you're critiquing, or if you care at all about the person that you're critiquing, you'll go the extra mile to make sure that they know you're not coming to them as an enemy. But did you always do that? No, not at, at first I didn't. Mm -hmm. At first I didn't, I didn't care. But when I started to realize that there were people that were watching the show and connecting to things that I was doing and saying, I want to serve them in a better way. And also, be an example of how to go forth in discourse without being disrespectful. Yeah, so there were times where you shamed people. Did sure. you regret it? At first, no. I think that uh, when people hit you up, mm -hmm. you start to go, man, I could have gone about that a different way. Yeah. But remember, anyone that's still breathing should still be growing, anyone. So it doesn't even matter if you did something yesterday and you learned if you did something on Monday. If you learned that it was wrong on Tuesday, grow on Wednesday. Mm -hmm. So for me, and I was, you know, I was a little bit of a younger guy, I had to realize how best to use 
the voice that I have. Right. Mm -hmm. Speaking of how best to use a voice that you had, you said, I think everyone says how divisive things are, and I think that's a buzzword. But the real problem is that there's a culture war that's happening. How do we have conversations that bring people together and not polarize? By establishing, it, establishing what it is that we all want, mm -hmm. right? If I look at you and I say that I want freedom, justice, equality, okay, and then you look at me and you, you know that, uh, that I want the same thing, we can argue about what's at the margins then, right? But if I'm telling you you're un-American, you're telling me I'm un-American, the antithesis of those ideas that we just put forth, right? You're hurling insults, you're making assertions about my character, I'm making assertions about your character. Now, the conversation that we're gonna have is not about the nutrition, okay? It's about the fat. Mm. We're not gonna get to the crux of what it is that we're supposed to talk about. Because if we talk about that, that leads itself to the most beautiful word in the English language, which is compromise. If you want to make the best America possible, and I want to make the best America possible, or the best world possible, take it outside the country, if there's sincerity in that belief, we might have different ways of going about it, but if we trust each other that that's what we're trying to do, we'll be willing to meet each other in the middle of that. When people talk about being divisive, it's because there's an intense amount of tribalism that is going on in every single cultural conversation that we have. Now, a lot of it is understandable, but that doesn't change the fact that if we're to get to a place that's better than the place we are right now, then we're gonna have to find a way to cut through it. When you say trust, how do we trust each other? That's difficult with where we are today, with the pain, with the hurt. You know, I'm African-American woman, if I'm sitting there across from a Caucasian male, mm -hmm. how do I trust him without feeling like he might have a guard up or I might have a guard up? Well, I think the trust lives inside of humanity. And I think relating to someone on a human level is about trust. For example, if we're talking about the killing of an unarmed young black male or female, the first thing that everyone should agree on is that it's a tragedy is that somebody's mom is going to cry about that, somebody's dad is going to cry about that, there's going to be a community that is going to be affected. The first thing that should happen is that there should be a connection on a human level. Now, if you come to me and you say the thug got what they deserved, now I have to come to you and do something that black Americans and other types of Americans have done for the history of the country, which is explain to you why I'm worthy of life. That conversation is going to take precedence over whatever it is that we're talking about. Mm -hmm. So I'm asking for people in the face of tragedy, in the face of progress, to be a little bit more human. Just humanity. Just humanity. Just be a little bit more human. Recognize. Mm -hmm. Before it gets politicized, somebody lost their life. And then let that spur you to try to understand how we can stop them from happening. I think that with social media, which I don't see as the great evil that a lot of people do, it's becoming cold and automatic. Mm -hmm. And the buzzwords come out faster than the healing does. So the first thing that we need to do is just recognize that we're all people. Mm -hmm. That's difficult, we bring a lot of stuff with us. I've experienced a ridiculous degree of racism. So there's a latent distrust for mainstream America that exists inside of me. I gotta work that out for me, mm -hmm. for me in order to best represent my culture and my community. But that's work that everybody has to do. Even when things aren't done, especially when you're talking about black and brown, mm -hmm. even when things aren't done purposely to hurt you, they still do, and the language can still be coded. The, the initial mistake is what it is. Whether or not you feel like someone did it on purpose or not, uh, I, that's up to you. But the initial mistake is what it is. But once you go to somebody and you express yourself to them, if they shut you down after that, that's the measure of whether or not someone actually respects like what your culture says, what your people say, and how that's they feel. And it's very frustrating to have a conversation with somebody or anyone um, where something directly affects you and it's a mild annoyance to them. Get exclusive access to behind the scenes footage, episodes from season one, and check out other bonus content only on Hillsong Channel Now. 
why do you think sometimes when we talk about Black Lives Matter, the defense might be, well, all lives matter. Where does that derive from? Well, that's racism. Mm -hmm. The term Black Lives Matter is addressing a specific problem, mm -hmm. specificity. We're saying we have a specific issue. And one way to marginalize black people or to oppress black people or any group that's been oppressed over the course of the history of America was to convince them that what they're saying isn't true. Mm -hmm. That we've had it just the same, which is a wild lie, right? Mm -hmm. So we've been given nothing but pain. Um, and that even in and of itself, even though that's a historical fact, that's a difficult thing mm -hmm. for someone uh, to come to terms with. It's hard to admit when you've hurt someone. It's hard to make inroads to someone that you've hurt to try to get better. So when someone says all lives matter, they're saying, really they're saying shut up. That's really what they're saying because there's really no reason to say that. The buzzword isn't black lives matter more, black lives only matter, it's black lives matter. And it's in the face of occurrences that seem to demonstrate to us that they don't. So I think that's born specifically of racism, but even in and of that, it's not like evil people do that, ignorant people do. Right. So I think that at the margins, evil is a lot smaller than what we think it is. Do you ever feel like your worth has been in question because of how some of the world views and put shame on being black and a man? Sure. Hmm. It's obviously worse for our sisters, but of course. Now I'm obviously uh, not a perfect person and I can be triggered at times, but what I am now is confident in who I am and not just who I am, but I'm confident in the sacrifice that the people that put me in this seat made. Mm -hmm. And I'm not just talking about my parents, I'm talking about my entire battery of ancestors. Mm -hmm. And I'm confident that what I represent is the ability to manifest their dreams. Mm -hmm. That to me, takes a lot of the anger, it takes a lot of the, the resentment out of it, and the only thing that's left is mission accomplishment. You know, how do I grow the culture of we? And when I say the culture of we, I don't necessarily mean black people. I mean people who love freedom, justice, equality, and inspiration. If you are for those things, doesn't matter what race you are, you can be down with me. Much resilience is required when the dignity of human life is brought into question. As a society, how can we cultivate this ability to see all people as equal and unify without minimizing the plight of those of us who suffer oppression? Real empathy and compassion are some of the key parts of the solution to healing humanity. But there are many things in life that can affect our sense of belonging as people. I heard Van share in the past about another aspect of shame that many people experience, but don't always feel comfortable vocalizing. I had the pleasure of being on your podcast, The Red Yay, yeah. Yay, that was so fun. That was fun. But you said so honestly that you struggle with going to church because you feel like you're not good enough. You mm. feel like you might not fit the requirement. Going back to you saying you're a bad Christian. It's still hard for me to walk into a church. Why? Um, you're going to make me cry. Like, it, uh, it's, it's, it's hard. Like, I don't. Like, there's a lot of shame. There's, like, uh, like, I'm trying my best to do my best, but I know I could be doing better. And, it's, and it's, um, it's difficult to be around that many people who are better than me. They're not better than you. Who's saying that they're better than you? Yeah, but they're doing it right. I intellectually understand what you say. Intellectually, I get it. Intellectually, from what I read in my Bible, intellectually, from what my mother and my father and the, you know, the people in my church on Louisiana have told me. Spiritually, mm -hmm. I want to be authentic. Like I can be a fraud in anything, but I cannot be a fraud before God. It's just hard for me to come to terms with. Do you think that's conviction or is that shame? Well, it's certainly shame. I've been able to eliminate shame from so many areas in my life, but I have not been able to address my spiritual shame. So do you feel like you're running from God? A little bit. Okay. Mm -hmm. But I'm addressing it. I'm trying. No, you are. Why, do you, are you running from him because you don't want to live that life that you think you have to live? 
It's not necessarily that. <laughs> it's just you want to be up to the standard. Help me to understand what standard you're talking about. So I'll tell you, like, I, I think I, I mentioned this to you, that feeling of being around someone who is truly loving and nice and giving and nurturing and like really is enveloped in Christ. Like you can't fake it. There's a feeling like you can feel it. You feel it coming off them and you go, I want that. Mm -hmm. Like I want to be that sure. Also, I have all of these dreams and goals that I've been working for forever. What if those aren't the dreams and goals that I'm supposed to be working for? You know how you'll figure that out? It's connect to the one that created you. I'm trying. What do you think about this quote? John Newton said, I'm a great sinner, but God is a great savior. I think that's an amazing quote. I think that's how I would like to feel. I think that I did a lot of self, uh, self evaluation after we spoke. And I think that the first step for me was just talking to God more and involving God more in moments of triumph and moments of reflection, just involving God more. Undeserved kindness can be a hard pill to swallow. Being unconditionally loved despite our flaws is not something we necessarily come to terms with easily. Resolving to be transparent with God and with ourselves in both the highs and the lows is an important foundation to build from. But how do we do that in our toughest times? Van found himself in a very vulnerable state when his career path took a sudden turn. And so I wondered how he navigated that intensely difficult moment. Circling back to your job at TMZ, mm -hmm. you just recently got let go. Say fire. <laughs> Say fire. I was trying Say to just fire. Say I, fire. I don't want to lay it on. People are like, yo, Van, I'm sorry that you left TMZ. Uh, well, you didn't Van, I'm me sorry go. you got let go. I'm sorry you and TMZ parted ways. Fired. fired. It's completely okay. When you got fired, mm -hmm. how did you escape the shame and the embarrassment of it all? At first, I didn't. Um, when it first happened, no one knew. And then after a couple of weeks, I get a call. And the call says, uh, this is so-and-so and so-and-so from page six. And then they ran the entire uh, situation down. That Monday, that comes out. And now I know that I'm going to be on the other side of a story. I was petrified. Mm -hmm. Petrified. Because what does this mean now? Does this mean that nine years of me being who I am is now washed away? Does this mean that now I'm angry, I'm untouchable, there are gonna be people who don't wanna work with me? Has everything that I've established in every way that I've conducted myself, not just there, but in my life, I've been a peacemaker, I've been someone who's never been in any trouble. I've been somebody who's always tried to use the gifts that God has given me to bring people together and get them on the same side of things while telling the truth mm -hmm. in a very plain way. It's now all of that gone. I still had to go see a cardiologist. I'm walking around, my heart's beating funny. Like I'm smiling at people, but I, I feel completely unhealthy. I'm not sleeping. I had to start taking beta blockers. I was gorging myself with junk food. I was scared. And of course, people are trolling you. People are like, oh, I'm so happy. I'm glad to get your races, blah, blah, blah. I'm glad to get this, blah, blah, blah. And you back back for a second and you go, no, it's, it's me. It's like, it's, it's, it's Van. Like, people know me, but like, like so why is this? Why am I having to redefine myself? Like, why is this happening? What was your conversation with God like then? All right. That's exactly how the conversation was. It's like, okay, I'm trusting you. Whatever you say, guy. Mm -hmm. And right away, grace found its way into my life. And even though it did, I still didn't, I still didn't allow you it. You said grace found right it? Right away. How? Because the support was overwhelming. Mm -hmm. Like, I couldn't have even predicted that people would have cared that much about what was going on with me mm -hmm. and what was going to happen to me. It's like weird little angels being put in your life and you guys never, ever, ever ever underestimate the value of a positive word, ever. I had a meeting at a place. I leave the meeting, I come down. The meeting went great, but 
I'm just like drowning in insecurity and uncertainty. And this beautiful sister like looks at me like when I'm coming down, I'm about to get in my car and she goes, God got you. Mm. And like, I was, yo, I was like, just, I was tripping. You know what I'm saying? Like, I was like tripping. And I like, I like, and I sat in my car and I was like, man, do you have any idea like how badly I needed to hear that right then? Mm. And that just started this entire deal of like me walking around for the next couple of days and it was almost like I would fall and then the spirit would pick me up. I would fall and the spirit would pick me up. And until the point that I just was like, okay, I believe things are gonna be okay. It seems that our connection to God and to others is where the truest resilience is formed. We alone experience our unique destiny, but we are not alone as we journey through it. Perhaps there isn't a one-size-fits-all solution to dealing with shame and pain. Maybe the answer is knowing yourself and putting in the work that is life-giving to your personal identity and purpose. How can we be resilient in both showing ourselves grace and being continuously molded into who we are called to be? Like a lot of people are able to go through a bunch of different things and still come out on the other side of them feeling completely okay. I can't do that. Like it bothers me, it gets to me. I cry, I pout, I have a panic attack. So I really have to work at it. And it took me a long time to even like get to that point. Mm -hmm. Now I realize that if I want to be mentally clear, and spiritually clear, I have to work on it a little bit more, whatever reason why. So I have to research it and use techniques to do it. What words could you lend to someone, um, words of encouragement that are struggling with mental health? The first thing that I'll say is you're worth the technique, whether it be therapy, whether it be medication, whatever it is, you're worth it because it's not gonna be easy at first. You have to put a value on your mental health. Whatever that value is, you're worth that. It's gonna cost maybe money. It's gonna cost maybe time out of your day. It's gonna cost maybe time other, away some other things, but prioritize that as much as you will prioritize anything else. The second thing is, it is fixable. Now I can't speak to all of them, but I can speak to my anxiety disorder. There was a time when the paramedics were coming to my apartment in Louisiana so much that they knew me by name. The toughest thing to get through to somebody when they're, when they're going through that is that it doesn't always have to be that way. But the truth of the matter is, it doesn't always have to be that way. Do you feel like going through all of this, you have a better understanding of who God is? Yeah. While you're in the middle of something, even though you believe in the order of things, you're still asking, okay, why is this happening? Mm -hmm but you have to be connected to the belief that like it's not about you and it's about something bigger mm -hmm. and you have to go through it. This instance is not for nothing. This breath is not for nothing. This step is not for nothing. This drive is not for nothing. This conversation is not for nothing. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean that it's always going to mean what you think that it means and it's not, it doesn't mean that it's always going to be easy to go through. Mm -hmm. It's interesting that you say that the trolls, the bullying, the shame, what happened to you took you that far, but then you have this other perspective of it all means something. Mm -hmm. There's there's purpose to it. How do you differentiate when you're in it? It's hard. Uh, it was, when I say it was, it was hard, it was incredibly hard. Mm -hmm. Number one, in that situation, having people around you is very key. I also really took time to examine exactly what was happening. Mm -hmm. To like try to take myself out of it and look at it. I think that it was a lesson because it was important for me to be on the other side of something that I had been involved in in a very, very long time. Mm -hmm. And it was important to me to feel those emotions. It was important for me 
and the man that I want to be and the professional that I want to be going forward to understand what it is that I don't want to be a part of mm. and the kind of things that I don't want to do. That pain that you endured or maybe still enduring, what do you think God does with, with that pain? Uh, he took it from me. Mm. He's like, yo, be human. Now I get back to work. Be human. Feel this. Talk to me about it. All right. We did that. I understand as my son that you went through that. I understand as my child that you went through that. I get that. Be empowered. Mm -hmm. No excuses. Assert your destiny and try to do it through me. Not everybody does that. I did. And, and it's, it's hard to do. I've attacked so many different things in my life um, that this ended up being something else that I attacked. But also, I was able to go, okay, I can't go back in time. I can't change this. I can't be vindictive about it. Riling everybody up and making everybody more upset and more triggered is not gonna work. I open myself up to whatever's supposed to happen. Mm -hmm. Just going, all right, I'm not going to be able to self-medicate myself out of this. I'm not going to be able to eat myself out of this. Nobody can tell me that I'm okay. I have to say, I trust. Mm -hmm. And it is not like it happened in one. I, I would have loved to have been walking through Griffith Park and have seen a bluebird. Oh, there's a sign. Oh, <laughs> I trust. And then all of a sudden I'm okay. Nah, it took some time. Do you think that you had to trust because you were so desperate, you had nothing else? Maybe. Mm -hmm. That's not an unfair thing to say. Mm -hmm. But also doesn't mean it wasn't the truth and doesn't mean it wasn't the way out. Yeah. And for me, I feel right now better than I felt in a very long time. Awesome. How do you hope to grow? Every day. Every day. Sometimes the reason why people don't want to know themselves is because they, they don't want to know the parts of them that aren't perfect. That's the thing that you start to know when you really start to know yourself, when you really start to get into who you are. A lot of times it's not a very affirming thing to do. It's not a very, uh, you don't feel powerful by knowing yourself. It's a vulnerable thing to it's do. It's a vulnerable thing to do. Mm -hmm. The more I know myself, the more I grow because the more I see how I need to readjust the matrix that is me. Mm -hmm. The one day I think I have it all figured out, the one day I think, oh, I'm good, it's probably the day I'm, I'm gonna fall off. You should run. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs>
times and I was just at rock bottom. So rock bottom that I was suicidal. I had to just acknowledge some of the things that I've done. Some of the things that I thought were the hardest things to ever go through, those were the things that solidified in me, try me and try God. There is so much hope and encouragement given when you're transparent with your story. People, they don't want to see the perfect story. You've got to refuse to allow yourself to be defined by your mistakes. You can't do anything to change the past, but you can change your perspective of the past. The beauty is, is we're discovering how to dismantle shame robbing us of our full potential.